Welcome to the Building a New America podcast, Law, Politics, and the Constitution. I'm Jonathan Arias, your host. This is the show where we take current events and analyze them through our Constitution. Before we get started, make sure you go over to the banner uh, pages and make sure that you give us a follow. We're really trying to grow this podcast, so make sure you go over there, subscribe, share with a bunch of other people if you find it helpful. Make sure to follow me on Instagram and Twitter at John Arias, J-O-N-A-R-I-A-S. So let's get into this thing started. So being that our constitution was drafted over 200 years ago, one thing that the founders could not have predicted was the technology that we have now. Since the constitution is the supreme law of our country, it's exceedingly important that we update the document to our era. One thing that isn't stopping is technology. Day by day, it's becoming more and more powerful. In 2013, a man by the name of Eric Loomis pled guilty to the charges of eluding an officer and operating a vehicle without the owner's consent for driving a car that had been used in a shooting. At his sentencing, the judge determined that he was a high risk to the community and thereafter gave him six years in prison. In determining that he was a high risk, the judge used an algorithm called a compass assessment, a tool that attempts to calculate the likelihood that someone will commit a crime in the future. Now, Loomis appealed his sentencing on the grounds that his due process rights were violated because the method behind the algorithms was not disclosed. This algorithm asks a number of personal questions such as who you interact with, how you spend your time, your education, your social economic status, and then predicts whether you'll commit crime again. All this sounds very similar to the 2002 movie Minority Report, and many people justify, justifiably so are concerned where these systems are going. Now, if you ask yourself, Jonathan, I don't commit crime, I don't interact with anybody who does so, why should I even worry about this? Well, my answer is that these systems are being used in practically every facet of your life, and you don't know about it. Let's go to insurance, for example. Recently, the New York Department of Financial Services announced that it was going to allow life insurers to use data from your social media when setting premium rates. So whoever you're following, whatever you're liking, it's probably being collected and being used to predict the future or something that you'll do in the future. Let's go over to employment. When you submit an application, there's a good chance that your application is not being reviewed by a human being, but an algorithm. Not only that, if it's going to a big company with thousands of resumes, this process is most likely being used. And once you get your job, there's a good chance that your evaluations are being determined by another system that you don't necessarily know about. And even if you don't work, even if you don't worry about insurance, if you're on dating apps, which I'm pretty sure a lot of people are, your matches are determined by a system that you don't quite know about. As you can see, these systems are everywhere. And what they are all trying to do is predict the future. And they are trying to predict the future with information that is being collected from you. Every retweet, every share, every comment that you make, it's all being recorded. In this episode, I have the great pleasure of sitting down with Vincent Sutherland. He is the executive director of the Center on Race and Equality and the Law at NYU School of Law. Before his role as executive director, Vincent was an assistant federal public defender. And prior to that role, Vincent served as the senior counsel with the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. He began his career clerking for the federal court judges at both the circuit and appellate court level. Vincent, you're quite the accomplished man. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Awesome, man. Thank you so much for really investing your time into this project. We really want to you know, uh, bring civic engagement and um, demystify the Constitution, the document that controls essentially how we live in this country. So let's get started, Vincent. Why don't you tell us you know, what you do at the Center on Race and Equality in Law? Sure, sure. So the Center was uh, created really to confront the laws, policies, and practices that lead to the oppression and marginalization of people of color um, in this country. And, and part of the work that we do is, you know, part of it is public education, part of it is research, part of it is litigation, part of it is advocacy. And some of the things we're really focused on and taking a deep dive in are looking at the criminal justice system in particular, because that system, I think, is representative of a lot of the concerns we have around racial justice um, in this country, and trying to figure out how do we improve or shape or change decision making in that system and how does racism and bias um, uh, shape the way decisions and, and outcomes um, um, are made in that in that particular system. Um, the other part of our work is really putting on kind of public educational events to help raise the consciousness around issues of race and inequality and try and shape and change the narrative um, that this country has about race in America. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's really kind of the focus of our work. And then 
within kind of that broader framework, um, some of our work looks at parole reform in New York State, so mm-hmm. trying to shape and change the parole hearing process here. Some of our work looks at kind of racial isolation and segregation in places like Syracuse, New York, um, and other places around the country. And some of our work looks at this issue of, of technology and the criminal legal system and other systems that govern our lives. Yeah, so let's go into technology and the law. I know you've been focusing on these algorithmic decision-making processes. I brought up the Loomis, Wisconsin case. Tell us a bit more what's going on in the criminal context and the use of these systems. Sure. So, you know, the rise of technology and kind of algorithmic decision-making more generally has, has, has been kind of, over the last few years, we've seen it really grow and increase. And Part of that is because there is this, I think, growing recognition that our criminal legal system in particular um, is infected with racism, infected with bias. Our prisons and jails are, you know, bursting at the seams. And there's this understanding, I think, that we need to move as a country in a different direction. And so what people are looking for is a technological solution to a kind of long-standing problem in this country. And so there's been this resort to the use of technology and tools. And, you know, I I first kind of got interested in this, um, not necessarily in kind of the algorithmic decision-making space, but still in a technology space. Right in 2014, after um, Mike Brown was shot and killed in Ferguson, um, uh, Missouri, um, just outside of St. Louis, and there were a rash of, of police shootings of, of unarmed black men. There was a lot of calls for accountability of, of the police and to hold them accountable for the actions they engaged in. And I think one of the kind of tools that a lot of folks looked to were body-worn cameras. Um, this notion that te- technology would be able to hold police officers accountable, would be able to see kind of as as witnesses to what happened, um, uh, what actually happened from the officer's perspective and what the individual who was engaged with was was doing. And that would be a way of, of conducting some form of oversight and some form of accountability on these officers. And I think what we found is that, you know, there, there were also along with those kind of calls for the use of technology, there was also a lot of kind of warning signs and cautions thrown out by a lot of um, civil rights groups and and individuals and advocates um, who looked at this use of technology as another form of surveillance and that the surveillance when, when, when surveillance technology when placed in the hands of law enforcement and in the hands of government usually does not um, inured to the benefit of people of color. It usually is used in abusive um, and, and, and really destructive ways. And I think what we found is essentially that the cameras have not necessarily stopped um, police violence from occurring. Um, and then, you know, fast forward a few years, and now what we have as, as technology continues to improve is this growing concern that people use kind of the cameras and marry that with facial recognition software um, to then cast a broader net of suspicion around anybody who's captured and whose image is captured on these cameras. And so and so I think what we saw just with that kind of example of this effort to use technology to get at um, some very deeply um, embedded um, social and racial problems is that there is all this kind of room for um, uh, error and in this room for really um, rampant abuse um, and so that, that's that's kind of how I got into this space and then um, and then you know I, I didn't rec- necessarily re- realize or recognize it but even as I was a public defender earlier on in my career um, you know these types of risk assessment instruments in some ways were being used in in many of the cases that I was handling every day in court yeah. And as an example of that, I think they come in particularly for bail applications. So bail is a process where after you're arrested, you read the charges and then afterwards the judge determines whether you'll be released or not. And oftentimes there is a system that, again, tries to predict what your risk is to the community, what your likelihood is of returning to court. And they ask certain questions such as whether you're employed, how long you've been in the state, if you depend on anybody, if you have any reliance on you. And, and all this is done to see whether you are, quote unquote, a flight risk or anything that will tie you to the state. And it's interesting because me being a public defender also, we dealt with this all the time. And I didn't quite think that it would reach this far, especially with what we're about to talk, talking about right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no, it's 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 a little bit crazy, you know, because I think even, you know, in that context, like years and years ago, the way these tools were used, it, it, 
they, and we'll talk, I guess, a little bit more about kind of how they actually work, but they weren't necessarily tied to kind of a data set. Right. Um, the way it worked before was that if you had a landline, for example, or if you were employed or if you had some, some other kind of concern in your background, you get a certain number of points for that and you just kind of add up the points. Mm-hmm. And if you get, you know, say you get 12 points or 15 points or whatever number of points you get, then you were seen as a, as a, as a low risk to, right. to flee to in a low risk to kind of come, to fail to come back to court right. and so you were more trustworthy in some sense if you got negative points and you were seen as more of a high risk and mm-hmm. it made more, made it more difficult for you to be released um, and released without having to post some type of cash bail right. and now these tools are kind of taking the next step um, which is kind of tying them to a, a data set and trying to compare you to that data set to that data set right and then if we consider the Loomis case as you know I'm looking at certain the question that the Compass system asks and it's a number of questions personal psychological socio-economical and then from that data set they essentially try to predict the future but ultimately what I see here essentially at the core of Loomis was just the propriety information behind it which means you have a system that judges are uh, relying on or even substituting for their own decision making but we don't necessarily know how these systems are being created could you talk more a bit about the secrecy behind these systems right sure so so you know so the way these systems kind of work generally is the idea is kind of similar to what you were just talking about kind of in the opening um you imagine if you're watching kind of uh, imagine watching Netflix or some or you're choosing kind of a Netflix movie you want to watch and you 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 pick that movie and then what happens is kind of Netflix decides okay you watch this particular movie other people who watch this particular movie watch this other set of movies and so you might and so Netflix can kind of advertise to you to watch right. similar types of movies mm-hmm. right and so these systems kind of work in the same way um, what they do is they kind of look at you the individual being judged by the court um, look at kind of certain data points in your life and then take those same kind of data points and compare them to data points in a cohort of individuals who are not related to you, who you might not know, have any interaction with at all. Yeah. And look at what those individuals have done when they have been faced with the same kind of path in terms mm-hmm. of being before the court. Have they returned to court? Have they committed a new offense? Right. Um, have they engaged in some type of misconduct or, or gotten themselves rearrested? Um, and and then based on that kind of comparison, makes a judgment about or a forecast about what you might do. So mm-hmm. it's making kind of this correlation right. um, based on your own factors as compared with this group of, of other people. People, mm-hmm. um, you know, there is a difference, of course, between correlation and causation. Right. Um, and but we're treating these correlations as though they're causation. Yeah. Um, and so the way these kind of tools work and, and the kind of secrecy behind it is that oftentimes the, the companies that make these tools um, essentially weigh different factors in different ways. Um, and so kind of the, the, the weighting of the factors um, is what kind of shapes the score that you might get. So for example, um, say that you live in a particular um, uh, zip code. Um, you're employed full time, but you've but you have missed court in the past. Right. Um, having that warrant maybe weighted um, and missing court, which would lead to you having a warrant, maybe mm-hmm. weighted much more heavily than living in a particular zip code or being employed. Right. Um, as someone who is the accused um, sitting in court, you're not going to know because these algorithms keep that kind of information secret. Right. You're not going to go how they weight. That that particular exactly. piece of information, so you don't have, you're not really able to challenge, um, uh, and, and this is what happened in Loomis. You're not mm-hmm. really able to challenge the weight given to the particular considerations that the tool is undertaking to to arrive at a forecast for you, which right. makes the whole process kind of shielded in darkness. And so there's mm-hmm. this concern around these black box algorithms, right? Um, that are really making decisions that, you know we may know kind of some sense of what factors are going into them because mm-hmm. the compass algorithm for example has like as you mentioned a, a kind of a list of questions that you're answering and some other mm-hmm. kind of facts that 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 you know the the person kind of filling out the the uh, the score sheet can can glean from your own record mm-hmm. um but you're not you're not going to know what what weight those factors are given um, right. which really makes the arguments difficult to make in terms of like whether or not the tool is being is accurately reflected reflecting um uh, an appropriate forecast for you. Right. So before we even get into the content of the algorithms, the data that's being input, we have to have access to the black boxes to see what, what's actually going in there. Yeah. So Because when you consider, let's go over to, I believe it's Idaho, the Medicaid case mm-hmm. where many people who uh, d- 
deal with developmental issues were having their uh, government benefits substantially reduced. And what essentially turned out was that these people were being interviewed by being interviewed by a contracted party with the state. Mm -hmm. And when they tried to find out why their benefits were being substantially reduced, the uh, company said that it's proprietary. We can't we can't give this up. The problem with that is that you're making these decisions with people's lives and things that are just not insignificant in that sense so i think i think the, the big problem here is that i can see the arguments for the efficiency of of, of these systems like for example if you mm. are the ceo of a company and you have to or, or an hr manager of a company and you have to go through thousands of resumes that i can see how the algorithms could make that work easier for you but then ultimately we have to consider what's being placed in there right you know so could, let, let's discuss a bit more about the bias data that's that's being implemented in there yeah. and and before i shoot it back on you what I, what I notice is that one of these questions, particularly in the compass system and Loomis, maybe Loomis is also where you live, for example. Mm -hmm. And if let's say you live in an area that has a lot of a lot of crime, then that will be weighed against you because in the I guess the link there is that because you live in this area, there's a greater chance that you commit crime. But right. then the problem with that is that what if you can't get out of there? Right. You know, right. what if you are essentially stuck to that area for a number of reasons maybe you can't afford to get out maybe you're a kid there's nowhere else to go mm -hmm. but then yet that is being weighed substantially against you so I think yeah. it's, what's important right here is that once you get past the, the secrecy of these systems is the information that's, that's being placed in there so could you speak more about like yeah. the, the information that's being put into these systems sure sure so you know one of the things that, that has really kind of been at the forefront of some of these arguments is the notion that we're gonna, if we have kind of this this data driven um, uh kind of actuarial model, evidence-based model of criminal justice that you can have a more efficient, um, more fair, and more just system. And um, what that kind of fundamental premise ignores is the the kind of overriding and overwhelming taint of racism and bias that yeah. infects kind of every single data point in our lives. And I think what we've kind of encountered as, as a society is this notion that um, you know, I think this is true for for many people who are engaged in the kind of design and, and, and implementation and oversight of some of these tools is that if we kind of just turn this knob here and, and, and tinker with this knob there, we'll be able to create a kind of a more efficient, a more fair and more just system. Mm -hmm. um, but that ignores, like I said, this this this, you know, the birth of America. Um, yeah. And the reality is that kind of, you know, racism is is woven into the fabric of this country. Yeah. Um, it is like literally the the ink on the blueprints of the plans for America. It's the foundation. It's the foundation, exactly. And so because of that, every data point that you look at is going to be tainted by racism um, and by some bias. And so it's impossible, I think, to scrub that bias from mm -hmm. the data itself and what that to me results and I think many others have, have thought about this and, and talked about this what that leads to is kind of this garbage in garbage out problem where yeah. you're we're, we're putting garbage data data that is essentially dirty um, and, 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 and expecting to get kind of forecasts that don't reflect that same dirty data. And that's that's just, you know, it, it's, it's, it's something I think it's really a significant problem. And I think one of the biggest problems when we think about the use of these tools, and I think, so even in the example time you just gave mm -hmm. about kind of the, the compass, you know, tool looking at um, your location and where you live as being problematic, um, you know, because there, because there may be higher kind of rates of crime. Well, you know, the reality is that crime is is not only stuff that's actually happening, but it's kind of what's reported and it's what, where police are. Right. And so when you think about crime rates, it's really about where the police have been kind of allocated and where they've been deployed to. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is more of an indicator of, any, of, of what's happening than anything else. And we know from just our New York experience that yeah. police deployments here and kind of from the stop and frisk era, um, it was there was a clear kind of racial bias um, in, in kind of where police were deployed and where they were where they were enforcing the law. Yeah, and it gives it, it gives this kind of impression that particular neighborhoods are far more criminal than others when that's not necessarily the case and not actually borne out by um, if, if you if you enforce the law kind of even evenly across the board. And so I think that kind of that problem in particular is is is, is I think one of the really difficult nuts for folks to crack when they think mm -hmm. about kind of the use of these tools. I had a couple colleagues that um, mm -hmm. 
in NYU who wrote uh, a piece um, uh, called uh, about dirty data, basically, mm-hmm. where they looked at uh, predictive policing systems. Mm-hmm. Um, so these tools are also used to try and predict who may be a victim or a perpetrator of crime or where crime might actually take place in, a ter- in terms of a geographic location. Mm-hmm. And what they discovered, um, so this is Rashida Richardson, Jason Schultz, and uh, Kate Crawford, um, all of whom are affiliated with NYU Law School and AI Now Institute. And what they what they discovered was that in kind of looking at these um, predictive policing systems in a number of cities, they looked at cities where the um, a police department had been under some type of consent decree um, mm-hmm. because they engaged in um, um, unlawful policing and abusive policing practices and engaged in racial profiling. And what they, di- what they discovered was that a lot of these systems were relying on that same dirty data. The I data see. was infected by racism, infected by biased policing mm-hmm. in order to build their predictive policing systems. And so, of course, when you're predicting that poli- that that crime is going to happen in a place where you've seen a lot of Mm-hmm. Where, you, where you're already over policing and over enforcing the law, right. then you're just going to kind of go back to those same places, right. and it's going to create this feedback loop, mm-hmm. um, which is you know undermines any kind of validity of any type of forecasting or, predi- or so-called prediction you're trying to make. Right, and I think the issue here is just removing the humanity from this whole system, like removing mm-hmm. the decision-making process that we can only rely on throughout, you know, uh, you know, while somebody goes to the criminal justice system. But let's talk a bit more about like. Specifically, the the information that's being placed in, into the systems. Could you talk, yeah. talk a bit more about that? Yeah, sure. So, mm-hmm. so oftentimes, a lot of these systems rely on someone's prior criminal history, um, mm-hmm. and of course, as, as we know, kind of from our country's um, experience with with criminal law enforcement, um, generally the law is enforced far more heavily and in biased ways in communities of color, mm-hmm. um, and so, you know, that data point in and of itself is a huge reflection of the biases and racism that we see in American society. Mm-hmm. Kind of other types of data points that we think about are someone's like social network, who they might be hanging out with, who they might be spending time with, yeah. um, what their level of education is, um, their age at first contact with the criminal justice system, um, um, where they might be living kind of in terms of their zip code and, mm-hmm. and their location, what their employment history is or employment status is. Um, and all these data points um, have have are all kind of can be all filtered through the lens of race and yeah. looked at through the lens of race and racial bias and mm-hmm. all of them I think um, help to produce and reflect um, uh, in their forecast those biases and so yeah. that, that's deeply problematic yeah what, what do you think the potential solution is do you think it's to not use these systems at all do you think it's to just integrate more justice into it as cheesy as as cheesy I, I hate to say hate yeah. to sound cheesy but what I notice is that with many of these systems they are being programmed by people who don't necessarily know anything about that particular industry right so maybe it could be a matter matter of having stakeholders more involved in this process like opening up the black box making sure that they're not creating the systems in a vacuum but I mean what do you think the do you think the potential solution is to just not use them what do you think we should do so that's a great question um, you know so I think you know my, my first kind of response is that until we are able to suss out or figure out kind of how it is that the bias data is affecting the forecasts that are being made that we need to kind of call time out in terms of the use of these yeah. tools um, to the extent that that's not possible I think what we what we and others have suggested um, is kind of a harm reduction model um, and so what that looks like particularly in a pretrial justice context when we're thinking about bail is using these tools not to say whether or not someone should be detained and held in custody um, but rather to identify kind of a cohort of individuals who we think should be released without any question whatsoever mm-hmm. and then for kind of the folks who we think the tools are forecasting that they pose some type of a risk, that those individuals should then be provided with kind of all the types of procedural due process that, that they are, are, are entitled to in terms right. of um, not only having counsel, which you should have at, at you know for your first appearance before a, a court anyways, mm-hmm. but um, discovery um, in terms of all the information that, that may be being levied against you in terms of the accusations against you in a particular criminal case, um, a robust um, detention hearing where the where the government has the burden of proving um, by some significantly high standard, right. um, clear and convincing evidence, um, um, or you know that that you know 
that you pose a risk um, to flee or you pose some risk of public safety in some way. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think at best, these tools can be used, I think, in that kind of harm reductionist model. But I think, you know, it all at all stages, these tools are kind of not created equally. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that's at the pretrial justice stage, I think there, there's a way you might be able to use the tools mm -hmm. with this harm reductionist model. Um, when we think about sentencing, where the tools are really focused solely um, on whether or not we think you're going to commit another crime, mm -hmm. um, you know, that to me smacks of and kind of undermines all the other reasons why we think about sentencing. Right. Um, and so if, if, you know, if we think about kind of your journey through the criminal legal system and the only thing we're concerned about is whether or not you're going to reoffend, mm -hmm. um, we're not concerned about whether or not you've been rehabilitated. We're not concerned yeah. about ensuring that you're going to be able to get back on the right track and, 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 and you know, move forward with your life in a positive and, 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 and productive manner. Um, then I think these tools really do a disservice. And I think beyond that, you know, they create kind of this distance um, because a judge who's imposing a sentence based on a tool in part is able to say, well, you know, um, it's not necessarily me that's saying you're at risk. It's right. this kind of computer program. Yeah. And, you know, part of the, you know, probably the funny thing, the ironic thing about technology is um, we are so prone to be biased by the use of technology. There's kind of this automation bias. If a computer is yeah. telling us that that this is the answer, then it must be right. Then it must be right. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like when you, if you ever go, if you go ever go on your phone and you type in kind of some address mm -hmm. on your maps, and you know, you know in your mind you should go a different way, mm -hmm. but you end up following the phone. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> yeah, <You know? laughs> that's crazy. That, that, it's like the yeah. same. So it's the same yeah. kind of psychological process is going on. <laughs> That's hilarious, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so, and so, you know, I think there there is kind of this this creation of like this social distance that these tools. Um, provide mm -hmm. and, and that's particularly troubling in a system that's already designed um, to create a distance between human beings and allow you to do horrible things to people and so I think part of the solution is you know thinking about this harm reduction this frame part of it is um, ensuring that you know we know kind of the ways in which the data is is, is actually reflective of the biases that we ha that we have and so we accept kind of the premise that right. racism is a, is a part and parcel of all the stuff that we're interacting with and dealing with mm -hmm. I think the other two things that kind of come to mind to me for me is you know, all these tools right now are aimed at the people who are kind of being shuffled through the criminal legal system yeah so they're all aimed at determining whether or not um you as an individual who is who is accused of a crime or you as an individual who is facing sentencing poses some type of a risk um but we don't have if we're really concerned about improving the system we don't have any tools that are aimed at the actors in the system itself mm -hmm. so we don't have any tools that say xyz judge when faced with this set of facts and this this type of individual tends to sentence black individuals more you know more harshly than right. white individuals um we don't have any tools that say um officer jones um who has been out on this number of shifts for this number of hours um and has engaged in this this amount of misconduct hmm. is likely to engage in misconduct again and right. so we need to you know not allow officer jones to testify anymore we don't have any tools that say this prosecutor um has been overcharging or has not been handing over brady information mm -hmm. or things like that so we don't have any tools that are aimed at these actors to balance, the it out. to balance it out right, right. so to me that's another kind of you know what's good for the goose is what's good for the gander mm -hmm. right and so we need to i think aim some of these tools at, at the individuals in the system and i think the last part of the kind of the, you know another solution another kind of piece of the, piece of the puzzle is um to provide kind of communities with the 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 ability and the space to have input into whether or not they think these tools should be used in the systems that they are kind of dealing with and operating in. Mm -hmm. um, and to the extent that they are being used in these systems, um, we should have communities being able to have kind of oversight of the way in which these tools operate and kind of regular validation to ensure mm -hmm. that to the extent that they're making forecasts, that those forecasts actually align with some kind of truth right, yeah. and some reality. And I think right now, a lot of that is missing. Um, yeah. I think to the extent we're talking about the criminal legal system, there's no way that we should have kind of black box tools at all. Um, at all. <laughs> yeah, um, it just it goes completely against due process and just knowing yeah. what's being used against you. One of the core principles is to be able to confront the witnesses against you. Right. And the witness against you in here will be a system that you don't know 
it's making certain determinations about you. So, exactly. but I think it's interesting that you raised the, I guess the the the, the thing about equalizing these uses of information. Mm-hmm. In fact, I came across an article recently that some sort of hackers group mm-hmm. hacked into some sort of government website and then released the names of many federal and state police officers mm-hmm. as a way of balancing this stuff out. Yeah. So the way I see it right now is that eventually someone's going to do it, and it's actually going to harm the people who are using it ways that they shouldn't be using it right so right. that's one way that is being balanced and i'm pretty sure they're really unhappy about that yeah but then even going even further in terms of some sort of like the spirit that we have in this country it is based off racism mm-hmm. and we are still dealing with that right now in 2019 yeah instead of restoring people instead of a, a, a theory of restorative justice it's all about it's all about punishing yeah right? it's all about just throwing people away and then what happens when they get out there's just no concern about it yeah i think now in the country there seems to be a shift more towards that mm-hmm. you know know you consider what's going on in the news for example the other day i came across uh van jones he's like working with the Koch brothers i don't know how much that's that that's gonna work yeah. but ultimately there's see there 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 is there might be some optimism towards mm-hmm. shifting towards much more of a punitive system to much more of a restorative system yeah. but i think that that's what it is if we technology it's all about how we use it yeah. right i think if we use it for abusive purposes then it's going to be destructive we, sh- we shouldn't do that at- we shouldn't do that at all yeah but then also what i imagine that the loomis judge did is that it allows us to just take our skin you know if we if we have a skin in, in a game then it kind of takes away our skin in that game right the judge he could have whatever impressions he have about somebody but then he justifies his decisions based off a system saying listen it's not me it's the system that's making this this, this determination right. it's not even about me it's what this is doing so yeah. i think it's our our over reliance and just faith in these algorithms yeah yeah i think that's exactly right and i think you know the other piece of this is that if you are a judge or decision maker in one of these systems and um you know, all the incentives are 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 driving you to follow what the tool is telling you. Yeah. Um, because if you're a judge or, like I said, one of these actors in one of these systems, and you ignore a tool that says that someone poses a risk of some sort. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, for some reason, that prediction or that forecast ends up being accurate and mm-hmm. someone does end up, you know, engaged in some harming someone else or, or engaged in some behavior that that crosses the line, so to speak. Um then you know the blame falls on you as the individual right. and that's kind of like the you don't want to end up on the front page of the of the local yeah, paper um, right. problem and so i think we already have those incentives in the criminal legal system um and i think these tools i think help to exacerbate those 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 incentives in a, in a very real way um and you know i think a lot of the pushback that that folks get who are kind of opposed or are skeptical about the use of these tools is that is this kind of compared to what question and so i see folks say that you know a judge's mind is a black box too it's better to kind of have all the information out there mm. so we're all kind of on the same page about it um and you know my, and my my response to that is that you know that 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 presumes that all the decisions that are have made up up until that point have been just have been just yeah exactly yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and have been transparent and the reality is that every decision that's been made up at that point has has had some bias and some has, has been affected with some form of bias and so i think you know, saying that we're we're kind of doing this kind of compared to what thing doesn't really I don't, I don't really get you anywhere. Right. Um, yeah. In a lot of places. Yeah, and it's interesting because I think anyone who's not interested in criminal justice or anything like that would think that this is like removed from what they're dealing with. Mm-hmm. But these systems are being used everywhere. Like I said in the in, in the introduction, where mm-hmm. I mean, your insurance rates are probably being determined by how fast you drive who probably who even gets in your car Mm -hmm. and also depends what neighborhoods that you live in i came across an article that said that this uh person's this guy's insurance was increased because of a particular neighborhood that that he lived in but he wasn't given an explanation in terms of why Mm -hmm. his insurance was being increased right and this is concept of like discrimination by proxy Mm -hmm. right where let's say for example you join a group on facebook that has to do with cancer for example right that information not being protected could possibly go to an insurance company and that could be somehow used against you i think what i'm trying to get at here is that our information is continuously being used in ways that we don't even know about Right, right i mean if you use alexa for example anything that you say is probably going to some type of system right you know the other day not the other day but i 
uh, research things online. For example, if I'm shopping for like a pair of sneakers or something like that, mm-hmm. I'll shop for them. And then throughout all my other social media uh, accounts, they'll just follow me in every other account. Yep. Like yep. I'll be on Instagram, it'll pop up. I'll be on Facebook, it'll just miraculously pop up. Yep. So I think now in 2019 or even before then, we're starting to realize that our information is being collected and being used in ways that we don't know. Yeah. And I think it's a matter of this might be the point where there should be more regulation around this stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's right. You know, Europe is 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 pretty far ahead of the United States in this space. They are. Um, when they, when they, and I think they've really, you know, the, there's a kind of the GDPR, which is like a like a kind of privacy regulation around personal data. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a really clear focus on how your your data is kind of an extension of you and yeah. you have kind of your your privacy is being invaded every time that it's being used in ways that you don't have any control over or any knowledge of mm-hmm. and you know here i think we just take that thing that type of stuff for granted yeah um and it's, it's really kind of a ubiquitous problem and i can imagine um that as we continue to develop these tools and as they continue to kind of grow in in, the, in, the, in their use and and kind of um in, in, in popularity mm-hmm. that they'll continue to pull kind of other types of data points right. for folks and so what's to say that so like when we think about bail and pretrial justice I'm just throwing out kind of like a hypothetical here yeah. the considerations that a judge has are in most states um, New York is kind of an exception but in most states it's are you a risk to flee purposefully like not come back to court mm-hmm. or are you a risk do you pose some type of a danger to the community or to public safety right um so what's to say that, you know, we won't start to kind of pulling whether or not you pay your bills? Yeah, um, which some um, companies actually use your credit report right. to see if you'll be a good employee. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, so, what's to stop that? Yeah, right? what's to stop kind of the, like these other types, of other parts of your life from being kind of pulled into the data pool? Yeah, it's like we're being computerized. Right. right, right <laughs> it's right, crazy. Right. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, it's, 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 a really, it's a really dangerous thing. And so I think, you know, we need to, you know, as, as a society, I think, hit the pause bu- button and step back and, and really think fundamentally about what is the world that we want to live in. Yeah. And to the extent that we want to build technology, we need to figure out kind of fundamentally what do we want to see as, a, as these systems, how these systems operate, and then build tools that will address that rather than kind of build tools around the existing systems that we already know are broken and problematic. Right, yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I think we're, we're pretty far from there, but I think to your point earlier that the reality is like these tools are simply that they can be used for good and it can be used for bad yeah. and fundamentally I think we need to have a reckoning in this country with the way in which race kind of shapes everything in our lives and has, has driven oppression and marginalization and inequality for, for, for centuries mm-hmm. um, and, and I think once we kind of have that reckoning and we still have I think we, we I think we've gotten our toes up to the line of it a few times over the course of history but have never kind of fully um, um, undertaken it Mm -hmm. Um, but until I think we get to that point we're going to continue to see these problems Mm -hmm. arise in different different spaces in different ways it just evolves yeah it just evolves and you consider it's 2019 right now but in 1964 there was another set of problems before that it just doesn't stop and i think we can never give up our fight for for justice Mm -hmm. i say a lot of cheesy things are here man (laughs) but essentially those those are some of the the guiding principles that that i have yeah let me switch uh roles a bit yeah. and bringing the Constitution a lot more. These sure. are the questions I sent you last week. Yeah. Which is, um, what section of the Constitution, in your opinion, offers the greatest potential for extending democracy? Um, so, you know, I think... Th- so this, this, is a, this is a good question. Um, when I think about the Constitution and I, you know, I, I, um, I think about kind of the, the, the way in which it was written and kind of the context in which it was written i think it's it's a it's an incredible document because it it stood kind of the test of time um and has been you've been able to kind of we've been able to adapt it i think over two centuries later um to the world we live in today um but i think to me the kind of portion of the constitution that provides the greatest hope for i think the extension of democracy actually is going to be article one which is like Hmm. the which and this may be kind of an unfair answer, but well, I'm giving it anyway. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. <laughs> you know, yeah. Article One is what governs kind of the legislative branch. Yeah. Um, Article Two is the executive, so the president. Article Three is is the judiciary. Judges, of course, interpret the law. Um, the president 
this president is an exception, but the president generally executes the law and enforces the law, um, and Congress makes the law. Yeah. And so, you know, the way I see it, um, in order to kind of deal with some of the really deeply ingrained and embedded problems that we have in this country, um, we need, I think, um, in terms of our, our policy making, to be bold mm-hmm. and be thoughtful and to be kind of cognizant of this country's history and make policy with an eye toward that. And I think what we've seen in terms of expanding democracy over, over, you know, the last, over the better part of the last century, um, has been, have been things like the civil rights act, um, the fair housing act, the voting rights act, um, these measures that have, have, have really expanded, you know, the franchise expanded protections to people, um, have really, expanded democracy yeah. and at it, at its at its root um those things happen because congress passed a law yeah um and so i think without kind of that fundamental policy making um um entity you know judges and and the the presidency and the, or the department of justice the executive branch really have very very little to do um and so I think, so, you know, to me, that does hold a lot of promise. Of yeah. course, like the lawmaking process is, is you know, incredibly difficult, yeah. <laughs> um, particularly when you think about like the very fractured democracy that we live in now, mm-hmm. where you have, um, you know, the, the you know, the, the Senate and, and the House being divided in terms of party, mm-hmm. um, the difficulty of actually passing a law and getting it through, um, particularly when a member of the opposite party is in the White House. Yeah. So I think there's all types of challenges there, of course. There's mm-hmm. no question about that. Um, but I do think fundamentally that um, as a country, when we make policy and we make law, that we kind of ingrain the values that we hold dear into those laws. And I think that's where we kind of have the big, biggest chance to expand democracy. That's a great answer. I never thought about looking at it from the three different articles. Yeah. That's a great answer. Thanks. Okay, the other one is, uh, what section of the Constitution was the biggest mistake? What section has caused the most harm? So this one is, is um, so so this, so I, I will say that this is, a, this is one that, that is a section that's no longer in the Constitution, but I think it, it definitely caused the most harm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, what I'm going to say is the three-fifths clause. Yeah. Um, and the reason I say that is because um, when we talk about kind of this idea of a national reckoning um, with America's history or our race, what we had at kind of the inception of the Constitution and, and, and as it was being drafted and, and kind of going through this effort was um, America – even very early on at its inception was in many ways at a crossroads and the debate and the fight was are we going to what are we going to do about slavery um the enslavement of black people simply because of their skin color and largely because of this you know economic um this effort to have kind of an economic base Mm -hmm. right free labor for, for 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 centuries yeah um and you know the the kind of founding fathers, and I'll call them founding fathers because they that's they were all men. Um, yeah. <laughs> unfortunately, um, you know they decided to punt on the issue mm. of, of slavery, and by punting, they they not only kind of it wasn't just like a punt, like um, uh, a harmless punt, so to speak. Yeah. It was kind of like that punt was actually the answer to the question, hmm. right? And so what they did in kind of saying that as a, a black person for purposes of representation and taxation counts as three-fifths of a, per, three fifths of a person, like yeah. you're not a whole person, right? Um, essentially said, we're going to continue with this, with this kind of fallacy um, about the racial inferiority of black and brown people. Mm-hmm. And we're going to do that um, in service of ensuring that the union stays together. Yeah. Um, a punt. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, so it, what it reminds me of, so Derek Bell, who's this, who's a law professor at, at NYU at, at the law school, yeah, um, yeah. was, this, was this, literally like the, one of the fathers of, of critical, critical race theory, race theory yeah. um, wrote this, this story called The Space Traders. Hmm. And in that story, what he talks about is this idea of um, these aliens coming down to Earth oh, and yeah. saying, if you tra- would, what, what would it take for, for 
America to kind of trade all its black people to get rid of these aliens. Mm. And 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 there's a whole the whole kind of question about the story is like, is it going to happen? Like, mm-hmm. Are we going to trade all the black people to get rid of these aliens? Mm. And you know, to me, the question's kind of already been answered yeah. by by that three fifths compromise. Because what mm. happened was we said, okay, we're going to continue with slavery, we're going to continue with this fallacy about racial racial superiority of white people and racial inferiority of black and brown people. And on top of that, because we're going to count people as three fifths as a person, and most of the, most of the black people who were slaves were in the South, we then provided those Southern states with a permanent kind of um, with a permanent foothold in the democracy. Mm-hmm. And a foothold that gave them power, basically, and right. empowered them for for the next, you know, 70, 80 years until mm-hmm. the Civil War happened. Right. Um, and even then, um, we didn't, you know, reckon fully with um, our history, um, even with passing kind of the Reconstruction Amendments with the 14th, uh, with 13th, 14th, 15th mm-hmm. Amendment. We still didn't kind of fully reckon with everything. At all, yeah. Know? So I think, so to me, that, that kind of, that compromise... Mm-hmm. Um, early on said to black people like here's your place in this country yeah and that has i think colored everything since then to this day because i know if you if you bring up slavery to anyone who is uncomfortable with a conversation that we're having right now typically the answer is that we should get over it and just Mm -hmm. move on it stops us it almost works as an anchor towards moving to the future yeah but uh, what i continuously say is that we are living with the past and the future right now yeah you know james baldwin had amazing amazing quote he said that history isn't something that should be merely read history actually lives with us now Mm -hmm. and whatever moving forward is what we're dealing with in the past so i think just bringing up these concepts are extremely uncomfortable for a lot of people but if we don't bring them up there will never be any progress. Yeah. And even when I look back, when I, history has become one of my favorite subjects recently because mm-hmm. history to me shows you what's going on today yeah. and it shows you many of the parallels mm-hmm. because prior to the uh, Civil War, the events leading up to the Civil War, when the United States was discussing the issue of abolishing slavery and not abolishing slavery, some of the justifications for not abolishing slavery were just blowing my mind. Of course, mm-hmm. beyond the obvious racist ones, but one amendment that was continuously brought up was the 10th Amendment. Mm-hmm. that it was a state's rights issue right. that the concept of slavery isn't something that the federal government should be coming in and regulating it's all about what the states should do mm-hmm. whether it's moral whether it's unjust whether it's a horrible institution it really isn't for anyone to determine but it's a state's rights issue yep. and what I notice are, are many of these coded words that people are using even mm-hmm. now to this day to essentially cover up the atrocities that have always pervaded this country mm-hmm. and that's why I always go back to history and I consider what happened on now many of these arguments are still the same right now. Yeah. It just evolves over time. But it's yeah. quite interesting how you know the 10th Amendment was used to justify things. Or even when you consider before the 14th Amendment was implemented to essentially hone in the states mm-hmm. from the federal government, many of these... Uh, states were always going back to the original text of the Constitution, right? Saying that, mm-hmm. especially particularly for the Bill of Rights, saying that, well, it says that Congress shall not abridge, or Congress shall not do this, but we can do whatever we want. Right. So it went back to these textual arguments that just didn't hold any weight and were essentially being used to cover up all this crazy stuff that was happening. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. Um, final question. Yeah. Um, if you could amend the, con- maybe you, I think you might have answered it right now, but if you could amend the Constitution, what would that amendment be? So this is, a, this is a great question. Um, I didn't come up with it. It yeah. was our advisor, hey, your advisor. <laughs> but I, I'll take her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, when I, when I think about kind of amending, amending the Constitution, I think, you know, part of, so part of the problem with the Constitution that I see is mm-hmm. um, that it, it, it was framed in many ways by the context of the times in which it was written, mm-hmm. right? And so... Kind of in thinking about the answer to this question or thinking about my answer to this question, what I looked to really was kind of the constitution of like South Africa. Yeah. Um, the constitution of Ghana. Um, so these are countries that were under, you know, Ghana, in the, in the case of Ghana, was under colonial rule. South Africa, of course, was under apartheid mm-hmm. rule. Um, and thinking about it in a modern context, like what are the things that are missing? from our constitution that are present in those constitutions. Mm. And if you think about, like if you read like the South African constitution, for example, um, there are all these kind of affirmative rights of things that, that, you know, courts around the country have, I think, read into the United States constitution, but that's interpretation of the document. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. not the stuff that's in national document. Right. And so the South African constitution says, basically you have a right to housing, you have a right to education. Isn't that right interesting? To, yeah. So all these kind of, 
these these kind of fundamental rights to things that we all, I think we all think of as mm-hmm. critically important to survive sur- to survival in mm-hmm. society not only survival but thriving in a society a right to health care um, yeah. so I think in many ways I would probably amend the Constitution um, to incorporate some of those more modern um, I think more modern elements right things that probably folks in the you know late 1700s were not even thinking of, thinking yeah. about <laughs> Um, as as problematic or as necessary to kind of be a part of the Constitution, but are certainly like foundational in a lot of ways. And so I think, you know, I think the other thing about the South African Constitution and, and like the Ghanaian Constitution, like these other other documents, is they have this fundamental and core principle around human dignity. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And that's something that I think is, you know, perhaps in the spirit of the U.S. Constitution is there, but it's not explicitly stated. And so I think... Right part of like my amendment process would be thinking about some of those more fundamental things like health, education, housing, human dignity, um, are, are like, I think fundamental. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, you know, absent like an interpretation by a court of a law, um, that might may curtail or advance one of those elements, um, our constitution is not going to really support it. Um, right. And so I think so I think that's probably how I would try and amend it is kind of add some of those add some of those pieces. That's a that's a great answer. And actually the Ugandan constitution has another section as a section that says that the state will promote uh sports and athleticism. I believe that's what it says. Don't don't mm, don't yeah. quote me on it, but think uh-huh. about that because yeah. then think about the um the high obesity rates that we have in this country. Mm. And then if you have a constitutional provision that promotes health, like you said, it doesn't have to necessarily be the promotion of sports, but how all these principles that if you were to look 200 years down the line these are integral humanist concepts that we should never forget about yeah but if you look yeah. at our constitution um, it's interesting how many um, originalists think originalists are those who always try to go back to the original intent of the constitution and to me <laughs> I, I kind of laugh when I think about that because if we go back to what the original intent of the framers were it's just not applicable to I mean, we know what they are exactly <laughs> right. and we know what they are so yeah. we shouldn't necessarily uh, rely on them yeah I yeah. agree yeah, but, the, yeah, the, yeah. But, um, but those are great answers man those are uh, yeah. amazing answers yeah. but um so we're about to run out of time right now. Vincent, mm-hmm. where, where can people find you? Let them know, man, on social media, on Twitter. You, yeah, let, let, let sure, sure. So so on Twitter, um, my uh, my Twitter handle is uh, VM Sutherland, S-O-U-T-H-E-R-L-E-N-D. Mm-hmm. Um, our center's Twitter handle is at Race NYU. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can find us there. Um, I'm also on Instagram, um, same, same, uh, same as my Twitter handle. Yep. So you can find me there, too. Um, and yeah, um, I'm at NYU Law School. I'm pretty easy to find. Too. Yeah, so. awesome. Vincent, I really appreciate your time, man. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. It's been great talking with you. Thank you. All right, so now it's time that I give uh, certain shout-outs first. I'd like to thank very much our sponsor for this episode, Hobo Studios. They were gracious enough to produce this uh, podcast for us. Our sound engineer was Makan Tahawi. I'm probably messed that up. I'm so sorry. <laughs> and then, of course, we have Howard Bowler. He is the owner of Hobo uh, Studios. The executive producers are Andre Garrett and Marcus Sandifer. The podcast advisor is Hazel Weiser. The associate producer, showrunner, and the man that really puts all this stuff together, Jorge Navia. And then we have our social media manager, Zani Jackson Garrett, who essentially runs our social media and helps us out with all that. Again, like I said in the beginning, make sure you subscribe. Go on iTunes. Leave us a comment. Make sure you go over and follow Vincent on his uh, Instagram, social media, and everything else. He's doing amazing work at NYU and I will certainly follow what he's doing because all that we are essentially trying to do with this podcast is just to improve our democracy make it a much more fair and just country essentially you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at John Arias J-O-N A-R-I-A-S one on social media Uh, next week May 2nd I'll be sitting down with former governor Howard Dean We'll be discussing uh, democracy at the crossroads. We'll be discussing if this country is falling apart or not. But essentially, I'll be sitting down with someone who has a lot of experience in this whole politics scene. So if you would like to take us to that, you can go on Eventbrite and search Building a New America podcast, Law, Politics, and the Constitution. Make sure you get your tickets May 2nd at Civic Hall at 6.30 p.m. This is Jonathan Harris, and I'm signing off. Thank you very much. <laughs>